I've been doing a number of teachings on the feasts, and um, I can go on and on. I just want to say some things about it. Time is a womb for the purposes of heaven. Time is a womb for the purposes of heaven. Okay? Genesis 1 and verse 14 says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day, over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God said, it was good. Hallelujah. Africans know that you program the stars, the sun, and the moon for witchcraft reasons. So you mess up people's destiny. You make sure they don't know when there's an open heaven because they don't know God's calendar. Are you hearing me today? There's a programming that happens. Because you see, God programmed the sun, the moon, and the stars to do what? To tell us what God's calendar is saying. We are living under a solar calendar, a Roman calendar. It used to be a lunar calendar. Actually, today started last night at 6 o'clock according to Jewish time. Are you hearing me? And we need time to measure our days because we need to know how much time we've got, how much time is left. Are you with me? How are we doing in our book in heaven? Praise you, Jesus. How are we doing? Father, just give capacity in this place. Just put your hand on your head. Capacity, Lord. We need capacity right now. Capacity, capacity, capacity. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. Who's speaking? The heavens. What's there? The sun, moon, and stars. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. There's talking going on. And night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. God put for signs and seasons, the sun, moon, and stars, to tell you whether you're aligned with heaven or not. Okay? So we have to understand our calendar. Their line, there's a measurement even going out from the heavens. Their line has gone out through, out, through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent or tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. It is like the law, therefore, of the Lord, which is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Amen. It's a great psalm. I'm not going to spend much more time with it. But God has created time so that man can measure his days. It's the first thing that God calls holy and sanctifies is the seventh day, which is time. He calls a time and he sets it apart. Okay? He calls aside a place and sets it apart. That's why feasts are appointed seasons and set times so that we can rehearse. The Hebrew is mikra. We can rehearse coming in and out of his presence, you see, because we need 
some practice. Why do we need practice? Because we're not in the garden right now. So time has been set up, and the invitation is in the sun, the moon, and the stars for us to meet him for divine instruction, divine empowerment, divine impartation to do what you can do without that. You see, the word here for kairos in the Hebrew is a moed, or the moedim, or the seasons of God. And what they stand for is the seven feasts we know about. Amen. Are we all right? Okay. I just want to say this to you. <clears throat> Eternity invading time. You can have a look at this book. There's only a few of them. And I'm going to read this to you. In the beginning, there were no laws regulating time, seasons, situations, and circumstances. In the beginning, there was only the now. In the beginning, there was only right now. Out of the mouth of God would come his expressed will and desires. Each verbal issue from his lips was met with obedience as matter and substance were divinely controlled. The very essence of his thought life was seen when he spoke. You like this book? So far? Thoughts became words, words became objective reality. Everything was subject to the intent of his heart. The universe reacted to its creator's voice. The very first words, let there be light, demanded on the solar system he had spoken into existence aeons before to rush to the designated spot in the universe and offer up light as a form of worship to God. Every element responded in like manner, worshiping the word, honoring the divine intent, and fulfilling the command. Western man has become saddled with the concept of setting and achieving goals. The alarm goes off, and everything we think of is about time. And we say, I wish I had more time, I'm wasting time, this, that. And you know what? It doesn't, you can't see this thing. Time is a product of the revolving of the earth around the sun and the revolving of the moon around the earth. And without the operation of the revolving planetary system, there would be no calendar, much less a way to measure days or a person's age. God set the earth in time while man was created for the eternal. Man was not designed to die or to be sick. Man was made to live in the glory of God. The original atmospheric pressure of the earth was the glory of God. Of God. The glory of God is his total manifest presence. Man was created to live in the atmospheric pressure or glory of God. He had the distinction of possessing the DNA of God. He was God breathed, God inspired, and God's being on the earth, ageless. Time is not one of the characteristics of the glory. Time is defined by days, months, seasons, and years, but God was not and is not defined by time. This is why the church struggles with miracles, signs, and wonders. This is why we have problems seeing what we believe, etc., etc., because actually time is temporal. This is not a forever state that we're in. Time is part of matter. It is not a matter of time. It is not, it is a, not a part of faith. Faith is God's matter. It is the substance or material which represents these elements of God. Time was designed and created specifically for this earth. It does not exist outside this planet. How's that? The heavens are governed by the glory, which is the realm of eternity, where there is no time as we know it upon this earth. Therefore, when we get caught up into the glory, we experience his timelessness. It's another world. It's impossible to separate the presence of God from eternity or timelessness. Scientists have made a discovery. They discovered the speed of light is slowing down. They discovered the speed of light is slowing down. This is because eternity is invading time. Heaven is coming closer to earth. 
and we are at the consummation of time early in the morning of the third day. Time, as we know it on this earth, is a created thing. It is a fruit of the creation of sun, moon, and stars, all given to man so he could measure his days, known as the fourth day light. The fourth day light, Stacy. Amen. Since the full prophecy has been used by God to set the atmospheric pressure of time on the earth. Time is prophetic, and we understand God moves in cycles and patterns. That's why we have to know his calendar. I got this from Sheila. She has this guy, Dr. R.G. McLean, wrote this book, Eternity Invading Time. Where's the camera? Can you try and get this for me? I want you to put, if you can, put this on there. I'm going to take it right down. Yeah, I'll go right there. There's, there's three circles on that book. I couldn't believe it when I saw it because it looked exactly like the design that we had done. Can you see that? With the numbering around it. And Vincent, who did our design, had not seen this book until I, I saw it the first time when I saw, saw Sheila. Please give it back to Sheila. Isn't that wonderful? Eternity invading time. Praise God. Psalm 102, verse 13. Thou shalt arise and have, what? Mercy. What did Sean say it was? What did he say mercy was? Hanan. Thank you very much. This is very exciting. Hanan means to stoop in kindness to an inferior, to favor, bestow, to pray, make supplication, and show mercy. Okay? Everybody all right? Praise God. It's very interesting. The word comes from a root called Hana, which also means to pitch a tent, to encamp and to rest in a tent. Where are all these tents coming from? God has set a tent or a tabernacle in the stars. Now, this thing could mean he's going to pitch a tent upon Zion. For the time, this is the ETH season, the Kairos window, for the time, to favor, 2603, bend, stoop, in kindness, her, the set time, the moed, the rehearsal, the festival, the feast, the cycle, the pattern, is come. I really couldn't sleep last night. I was having so much revelation. I was just, didn't know how I was going to do this. So, we have the time, ETH, which is a womb, female noun for time in Hebrew. We have favor, I mean, the word favor, it comes from the word rachem, racham, okay? The word right next to it means womb. There's two pronunciations, just slightly different. Well, the one is to stoop in kindness and to favor and all that. The other one means womb. Womb number two in the scripture. The set time is a moed. Okay? The appointment. Do you know that God required them to come three times a year? Three times a year was the appointed times they had to come up. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, all males. It says Leviticus 23. When Moses spoke to God, he went into something called the Tabernacle of Meeting, Appointment, or Set Time. It's called the Ohel Moed, also translated 
the tent of the Setam or meeting. It is a womb, number three. This scripture, thou shalt arise, have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, the set time has come, has three wombs in it, all relating to time on a different level. If you look at our logo, we have how many wheels? Three wombs. God wants to bring something forth because he wants to build up Zion and he wants to appear in his glory, but something has to be birthed by the prophetic word in this womb of Kairos time, in this womb of favor, and in this womb of the tent of meeting. Are we doing all right? Amen. Do you know that we groan in our tents, our earthly tents, to be clothed from above? Why are we doing that? Because we want to be clothed with what? With the glory? Mary, in Luke 1, Mary in Luke 1, and 35, the angel answered and said to her, she's saying in verse 34, how can this be since I do not know a man? What is going to be? What is she talking about? The angel has arrived to enunciate a set time. He is arriving to tell her, you're about to do what? You're about to do what? To conceive and give birth because it's, the fullness, in the Greek, of time for Jesus to come. Amen? And then it says, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So the Holy Spirit, in the, in the Greek, will epi Schiazo, you. I'll break it for you. Bring a tent of brilliant glory over you. The Holy Spirit is going to turn this Kairos window is opening and you know like when you put a torch or a spotlight over someone's head, it looks like a tent. And what happens inside the tent? Mary conceives right there as that word is released to her of prophecy. Look at what she says. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And look at verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your rhema word, by the way. And the angel departed from her. There's a very serious warning when you mess with God's prophetic stuff in the said time. Matthew 12, 35, 36, and 37. A good man out of his good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man brings out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. By your words you will be justified or condemned is the Logos word. All right? But verse 36, every idle rhema word. Idle means something that doesn't produce, it is barren, it has no harvest, it doesn't do what it promised to do. If you say this is what God is saying and it is an idle rhema word, 
it is held in your book till the day of judgment. So if you thought that only applied to somebody over there that has to do Yom Kippur, shame these guys have to fast the whole day, Jesus is saying, excuse me, if you want to bring an idle, barren, non-productive word, rhema, you are saying, God is saying X, and X does not happen, it will be held to your account on the day of judgment. Amen. It's a good time to repent. Father, I repent right now. Every idle word. You know, heavenly typics works with repentance. Thank you, Father. We can repent before you for every idle word, every presumptuous place that we've been in because we're intercessors and we just go around prophesying over everybody and everything anytime we want to. Without order and government, I'm taking that very seriously. We was, we, that was spoken to us yesterday. Lord, we repent for that because actually it's going to end up in my book in heaven and I'm not looking forward to that. So, Lord, please forgive me. Forgive us. Thank you, Jesus. So, in Luke 1.35, the overshadowing comes. It's talking about being enveloped in a haze of brilliancy. And we are overshadowed, our tent, our human body, or our tabernacle, is overshadowed. And God then occupies and resides. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, our earthly house, this skinus, this tabernacle or tent, if it were dissolved, what's going to happen? We are part of a building, a house not made with hands, that is eternal in the heavens. And so we are groaning right now. We are groaning. Praise God. We are groaning because we are not clothed from on high. We have to have the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit to come down on us as a tent. We want to come. Africa wants to come, needs to come into the tent of meeting, into the council of God because God has a need to empower us. God has a need to impart to us. And we are not going to be able to do what is required for Africa in this hour without that empowering. And nobody is going to do it for you. You have to come under that Kairos moment, that ETH window. That as it opens, the Holy Spirit, there's an overshadowing right there if you're on time. But if you don't know the time, you have a small problem. Not only are you going to miss the bus, you're going to miss the whole story. Wouldn't that be terrible? Genesis 1 and 14, the lights are created on the fourth day. They are for signs and seasons, the Moedim, the Moed. Daniel 7 and verse 25 talks about the one that's going to stand up in the last days against God. And guess what he's going to do? He will speak against the Most High, he will oppress the saints, and he will try to change set times and laws. So he means to actually alter the very ordinances written in the heavens. Why do you think witch doctors are programming? Why are we in a Roman calendar and not a lunar calendar? Amen. But God is saying, I am sending a measurement because I am looking to dwell somewhere. The Mishkan was the tabernacle that they made. And when they made this tabernacle after Moses had, um, had a temper fit and all of that, the glory departed. And the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, was when the glory clouds came back. The overshadowing came back over the Mishkan. Part of that word, I will dwell, it means shakan. 
which means I will inherit, abide, dwell, settle down, and I will lie down as a lion. And I will pitch my tent. God is actually measuring to see where can he pitch his tent. You have one, he has one too. He needs space. He needs space. I say to you, how is your womb today? Is there space for him to pitch his tent over yours? Thank you, Lord. The stars are set as a tent or tabernacle, and a sign appears in Revelations 12. And guess who's there? A woman clothed with somebody here. Let's go there. You're all looking at me. Smile. It's not that bad. It's getting good now. You can smile. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. Verse 1. A woman clothed with what? The sun. Here we go. With the moon under her feet and on her head. What? A garland of 12 stars. She's arrived in the overshadowing of the Most High God. And because she has, she's with child, she's groaning, she's in labor and pain, right? To give birth. And here we have the lion, I mean the, the dragon come to fight her. But the woman gives birth and she bears a male child who is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Amen. For unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the what? Government will be upon his shoulders. Praise God. So now what has God to do with said times, Natasha? I'm getting, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Leviticus 23 gives you the feasts of the Lord. Amen. Leviticus 23. Praise you, Jesus. In the seventh Jewish feast, there's a perfect picture of the gestation period of the development of a human child. First feast of the Lord, Passover. Thank you very much, Zola Levitt. You can get this. I got it last night. I have had this thing for years, and I just pulled it up and came to the conference with it, and I opened it, and I'm going, wow. All right. He's asking this physician, Dr. Margaret Matheson, to help his research on the birth process. And her first statement is this. She says, on the 14th day, now, you think she might be in Leviticus 23. She might be. Leviticus 23, are you there? All right. I'm not there. Leviticus 23, and it says, <clears throat> verse 4, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. So, these are the feasts. These are the Moedim. They are holy convocations. They are mikra. They are rehearsals, which you shall proclaim at the Kairos moment when the window opens. On the 14th day of the first month, it is at twilight, it is the Lord's Passover. How is the baby formed? On the 14th day of the first month of the cycle, the egg appears. This is medical Research. Amen. So, what happens now? After Passover, then you get the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is occurring 
has to occur the very next night on the 15th day of the first month, according to Leviticus 26, 23.6. And so what happens to the egg in the womb? If it does not fertilize within 24 hours, the egg will pass on. Medical history. Amen. How are we doing? The egg stands for Passover, the idea of fertilization, the planting of the seed for unleavened bread, the burial of our Lord. His crucifixion on Passover will give us each the chance for everlasting life. His burial in the earth prepared each of us for a glorious resurrection. Next feast, first fruits. First fruits does not have a particular timing. First fruits, uh, the feast of first fruits simply occurs on the Sunday during the week of unleavened bread. It, can, it could be the day after, it could be almost a week later. So he asks the doctor and says, uh, Well, now what happens now? Oh, it's a little bit intermediate, indeterminate. The fertilized egg travels down the tube as, at its own speed. At its own speed. It may take anywhere from two to six days before it implants. Two to six days would be timed perfectly. Feast of first fruits, which is the spring planting. Implantation marks the moment when the fertilized egg arrives safely at its destination in the womb and begins its miraculous growth into a human being. So here we've got the first three feasts dealt with, and we are in Leviticus 23, and we are correlating. We are in parallel. Hello. God has set a tent in the stars. The Holy Spirit overshadows Mary with a tent of brilliance. We are in the Ohelmo Ed here. We are in the tent of meeting. We are in a set time to prophesy for Africa. Hallelujah. How is your womb today? Are you ready? Are you ready? Praise you, Jesus. And so now, there's no dramatic change until it becomes an actual fetus. This is the next big event in the birth process of a human being. And so he says, well, how long is that going to be? So he looks on the chart on the wall, and it's 50 days. And up until the 50th day, you don't know if this is a human fetus or what kind of fetus it is, actually. But I will praise you, Psalm 139. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did not see my substance, yet being imperfect, and in my book, in thy book, all my members were written, which, is, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! 23, Leviticus, and verse 16. Count 50 days to the day. Acts 2. When the day had fully come. What do you mean fully come? How can you fully come? How does the day fully arrive? It, because they count the sheaf or the omer in Israel for 50 days. So on the radio and on the news today, it is the first day. And today it's the second day. And so the 49th day, you kind of know it's the next day. So it's fully come when they say, Amen? Seven times seven and then the next day. Amen. So here you have human fetus at 50 days. Looking human, recognizable. Pentecost. Taking the appearance, the church took its appearance on Pentecost, its structure. Hallelujah. Okay, so now what happens now? Nothing momentous until the first day of the seventh month. According to the medical textbooks, at the first day of the seventh month, what develops now is the hearing. Just in time that the baby can distinguish one sound 
from another for the first time, the first day of the seventh month, for example, a trumpet can be heard as a trumpet. Hallelujah. So what feast is that? The Feast of Trumpets. And then the next significant event in the development of the unborn child occurs. When? Are you reading Leviticus? So when does it occur? Ten days later. Verse 27, Leviticus. On the tenth day of the seventh month, something happens. It is the feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And suddenly important changes happen in the blood of baby in the womb. It is necessary for the fetal blood, which carry the mother's oxygen through the baby system, to change in such a way that the baby can carry the oxygen that it will, that it will obtain upon birth. Technically, the hemoglobin of the blood has to change from that of the fetus to that of a self-respirating and circulating a human being. The fetus does not breathe, but rather depends on the oxygen obtained through the mother's blood circulation. Naturally, the system will be changed before birth, and that change occurs, according to the textbook, in the second week of the seventh month, to be precise, on the tenth day. God has designed you perfectly. It is precisely on that day, according to the Mosaic law, that the high priest takes the blood into the Holy of Holies, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, presents it as an atonement for the sin of Israel. Leviticus chapter 17 puts it this way, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The blood acceptable, how fantastically it coordinates with the changing of the blood in the body of the unborn child to make it blood acceptable because the life is in the blood. Just as the high priest enters the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifice, the blood of the unborn baby enters the Holy of Holies of this earthly tabernacle. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple tabernacle tent of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Hallelujah. God does everything by pattern and precept. Hallelujah. So now we reach the tenth day of the seventh month in the development of a human child. But the baby is not ready to be born. One more development is yet to occur, coinciding perfectly with what's our next date. Feast of Tabernacles, which has to happen on the 15th day of the seventh month in the Law of Moses. And this is the doctor's comments. That's when the lungs are developed. And as long as they get their little lungs going, we can bring them along. Even if they are born at an early time, I'm afraid if they decide to be born before these lungs are finished, then they have very little chance. But by the 15th day of the seventh month, a normal baby has two healthy lungs. And if born at that point, can take in its own air and live on it. What an incredible picture of the Feast of Tabernacles. The tabernacles is the house of the spirit, just as the lungs of the tabernacle of the breath. God blew breath into Adam to make him become a living soul, and Christ breathed the Holy Spirit on his disciples. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 37, the valley of dried bones. I mean, everything's there. Okay, they had bones, flesh, feet, hands, eyes, ears, but as yet, no breath. What has God said? 
Then say, he said, he, then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Here comes the prophetic word. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. That's verses 9 and 10, Ezekiel 37. On the 15th day, back to the baby, on the seventh month, the lungs are developed. From that day forward, the baby could be delivered and live. Where's my midwives? Please stand up. I want my midwives to stand up. Nurses, is that the truth? Stand. Come on, Jenny. All my midwives, can you wave at me? Can you testify this is true? They can, thank you. We have four midwives. I want you to, can you all just come here, please? I want you to all stand here. Five midwives. Hallelujah. Six midwives. Can you please testify that this is the truth? Hallelujah. I want you to just stay here with me. Are you having fun down there? Isn't that great? Hey, nurses. You didn't know your job was about the Feast of Tabernacles, did you? And about all the feasts, did you? Hallelujah. Amen. So on the 15th day of the seventh month, the lungs are developed, and so everything's ready. But wait a minute. We've only got 200 days, nurses. Okay. So what about 280 full gestation period in the birth of the, of the child? Remember, we're at the Feast of Tabernacles. And there are 80 days before the baby finally leaves its dwelling place of darkness and enters into light. A total of 280 days. So let's follow the system. What happens on the Jewish calendar on day 280? The Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, as it is called today, was not given by God on Mount Sinai, but it seems to have divine origin. Daniel 8, 9 to 14 talks about the abomination of, of desolation, which resulted in the daily sacrifice at the temple being taken away. Okay, then after 2,300 2, days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. The prophecy is fulfilled according to Flavius Josephus, 170 years before Christ was born. When Antiochus Epiphanes, a Syrian general, brought his army against the city of Jerusalem, he waged war for three and a half years and captured the Temple Mount. He desecrated the Holy Temple of God by sacrificing a sow, a pig, on the altar. Josephus said that this was the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The Jewish people continued to fight a guerrilla warfare against Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian soldiers under the leadership of Judas, Judas Maccabeus. They were successful after three years, three, and set about to cleanse the sanctuary. When they entered the temple, they found, what did you to preach about the first night? What did the woman have in her house that she had dominion over? The only thing that she had dominion over. They entered the temple. They found only one precious can of consecrated oil, a day's supply, with which to maintain the eternal light in the great lampstand called the menorah, also called the seven golden candlesticks. And they poured the precious oil into the seven lamps and lit them to bring forth light. It would be eight days before more oil could be supplied. And during those eight days, a miracle occurred. One day's oil supply lasted for eight days. So in honor of the great light, the Jewish people added the Feast of Dedication to their calendar, celebrating the day when the temple was cleansed. The set time has come. The millennial reign of Christ has been pictured in the Bible as coming through a birth process. Matthew 24 refers to 
War, disease, famine, end time signs, earthquakes is the travail of birth pangs. In verse 19, woe to them who are with child. Verses 21 and 22, for then shall be great tribulation such as there was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor no north shall there ever be, except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect saved, those days shall be shortened. Evidently, Jesus is referring to the birth process concerning the birth of the golden age, the kingdom of heaven, when Christ shall reign as king of kings and lord of lords, when the kingdoms of this world shall become. Just as the baby could be born any time after the 200th day, the birth of our new age could occur without depending on a precise schedule. Amen. The day cannot be calculated. We cannot know the exact day and hour of the birth of the child, but we can observe the travail of birth pangs. I am convinced we are near the delivery date. The kingdom is about to be born. This is called the High Holy Days, J.R. Church. Hallelujah. We are here at this conference because we have to have an overshadowing. We have to have an overshadowing. The time, the Kairos window, is prophesied in the scripture behind me. Favor also means a womb. Set time speaks about the tent of meeting or counsel that we are in at this appointed time. This is the 22nd day. Hallelujah. Last year, God gave us the keys of David on the 22nd day. Isaiah 22, 22. You got a key, a key holder because you should have had your key last year. This is the holder. It's called a tent. When you look at your key holder, remember, you're supposed to be in a tent that even the stars are speaking and measuring over you. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. Garland of star. like a diadem over her head. Because Psalm 19 says, He set His tent. And the bridegroom is coming out of it. Because she's pregnant. Heavy laden, about to give birth. Hallelujah. 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 Three times we have a womb in one line of Scripture. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The wheel within a wheel. Because God is saying, I will rebuild Zion and I will appear in glory. And I am coming to dwell. I am coming to Shakan. I am coming, the word says, to dwell in your midst. Verse 10. I am coming to dwell in your midst. Verse 11. I am coming, verse 12, to take my inheritance and possess, he says. Be silent. All flesh, verse 13, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. When God stands up, he wants to come down. And he wants us to come up. Because we have a tent, and he has a tent. And something is about to be born. On earth, as it has been prophesied in the sun and the moon and the stars. Because time is getting us ready to move into timeless eternity and to move into 
the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We thank you, Father, right now. We've got our midwives in place. So if you need an impartation, you need to come and find yourself an altar here in front of the midwives. They are trained in the natural. Anybody want to come? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you because we want to come up into your tent that you've made for us. And we are offering our tents for you to overshadow us. Great sign appeared in heaven. Great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. This is your set time, Africa, to get pregnant with a purpose that you were created for. We've opened our convention with that scripture. I am, I am jealous over Zion because he is coming to set up his tent God is looking to set up his tent. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.